Hello, I'm Laurie Sanders. I'm one of the co-executive directors of Historic Northampton, which is where we're here on the grounds of Historic Northampton. And we just completed the Reading Frederick Douglass event, which is the reading of his 1852 speech, which was given to an anti-slavery society in Rochester, New York. One of the things that's most impressive to me about Frederick Douglass's speech is that he builds a bond between himself and his audience. He reminds everybody who's listening of the things that we have in common, a love of democracy, a love of this nation, a love of what can happen in uh, a nation where the Constitution is respected and groups and individuals are respected. And so reading him is very relevant for today because it reminds us that we're on a journey together and that this can be a place where groups and individuals continue to be respected and we can continue to lean in to democracy and respect each other's freedoms, responsibilities, and rights. I learned so much each year about Frederick Douglass. I know he came through here at least six to eight times. Um, he was a part of a community of African Americans who were social justice advocates, folks like David Ruggles, folks like Sojourner Truth. And it feels really special to now be in the same, on the same grounds as a man as powerful as he was. And so I'm super excited to be here. I'm so grateful to Historic Northampton for hosting it. And I intend to come every year. Good morning. Thank you all so much for coming. Can um, I'm Lori Sanders. I'm one of the co-directors. Betty Sharp, the other co-director, is also here somewhere. She'll raise her hand at some point. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. I just want to have a few lo logistics before we begin. I want to thank Mass Humanities, who has played an important role in organizing the Reading Fre Frederick Douglass Together events for many years. Um, I also want to thank uh, Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, who cannot be here with us today, but her legislative aide, Julia Mathis, is here, and you'll see her as one of the readers a little bit later. Uh, Lindsay has played an important role in helping us organize this for years, so thank you to both of them. And it is my great honor and great pleasure to welcome President of Smith College, Sarah Willie LeBreton, to introduce the, today's event. So I have about five minutes of comments, and uh, I would say in the next two minutes or so, if you are two through ten, even numbers, just start lining up and odd numbers over here. So as I'm talking, don't feel don't feel shy about that. I really appreciate you coming out on this unseasonably cool and windy June day, and thank you so much, Lori. I'd like to thank Lori Sanders and Betty Sharp for inviting me to be your moderator today. And thanks to all of you who are public servants and volunteer readers and listeners, and those of you who have encouraged your organizations to support today's events. I too am glad to be here on behalf of Smith College. Like all of our American heroes, Frederick Douglass was a complicated and imperfect person. He was also a brilliant one, one whose clarity of purpose, moral compass in the cause of human freedom, political acumen, honed sense of persuasion, and oratory eloquence were among the most compelling of a generation. I understand that Douglas visited the area at least six times, the first in April of 1884, excuse me, 1844 when he spoke both to the Northampton Association of Education and Industry, the official group that represented a short-lived utopian community in Florence, and then to a crowd of over 400 at the town hall on Main Street in Northampton. Douglas's draw to this area was likely because of his deep connection to his mentor and benefactor David Ruggles, an African-American abolitionist, writer, publisher, and bookstore owner who assisted Douglas by offering him shelter, food, and money when he had first seized his freedom and arrived in New York a fugitive and penniless. Ruggles spent the last seven years of his life in Northampton from 1842 to 1849 when he died suffering from multiple illnesses. During Douglas's 1845 visit to Northampton, he sat for a portrait painted by utopian community member Elisha Hammond, 
that hangs today in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. Remembering our past is not a guarantee of understanding our present or thinking differently about our future, but it gives us a fighting chance. And remembering our past is not easy. We can know intellectually that we each have different perspectives, and yet we can be stubbornly committed to only one rendering of history. In fact, a singular telling of history, as opposed to the important stories we tell, can actually obscure the fact that there are also other histories in addition to the one we've learned or to which we've become committed. Humanity's next great leap forward, and friends, we are each capable of contributing to this leap, requires us to learn the histories of others. It is one thing to live simply, greeting each other, being kind to people in our families, our circles, and those with whom we come into contact, doing our best to tread gently upon the earth. It is another to live simplistically, giving in to the fantasy that everything about life is or should be simple. The stories we tell, the ethical quagmires that confront us, and particularly important for today, the history we uncover. The only way we advance ourselves is to embrace the complexities. I believe that our next truly great leap is not an advancement in technology or medicine. It is one where most of us see with multiple lenses, experience greater empathy, carry a deeper appreciation of the complex lives we all lead, and are less invested in reciting histories that make us heroes than in histories that elucidate those multiple perspectives. A celebration of only one unexamined history can become a self-congratulatory celebration that distracts us from any contradictions to it and actually undermines what we mean by truth. Indeed, this, as you will hear in Douglas in Douglas's argument, is precisely the point. And he achieves this with masterful skill. His demeanor is at once humble and confident, and his oratory is both self-effacing and shockingly eloquent. As our volunteer readers recite his words, listen carefully for a few things. First, Douglas acknowledges the informal status between himself and his audience by almost apologizing for speaking at all. Second, he shows his appreciation of the history in which his audience is deeply committed. And third, he acknowledges the righteousness of such a celebration. It is several minutes before fourth, he turns an unforgiving mirror up to his audience, one no doubt filled with persons sympathetic to the anti-slavery cause, but also so short-sighted by the singularity of their own creation myth that it never dawns on them how offensive the invitation is to one who was still vulnerable to the fugitive slave law. Listen as fifth, his critique almost becomes a moral flogging, nearly relentless in his descriptions of slavery's painful cruelty and the humanity of those who are enslaved. Finally, as he reaches both the close and the crescendo to his address, his final words are not his own, but those of his greater known and much admired white fellow abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison. 
and simultaneously he undermines any likelihood that he will be seen as self-aggrandizing by using the words of a white man, closing, as he opened, with acknowledgment of his lower informal status, and offering hope by implicitly exhorting them to join a movement rather than to languish in the inconsistency and shame of the country's behavior he has just minutes before described. And with that, we begin the reading. Mr. President, friends, and fellow citizens, the task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for its proper performance. I do not remember ever to have appeared as a speaker before any assembly more shrinkingly, nor with greater distrust of my ability than I do this day. The papers and placards say that I am to deliver a 4th of July oration. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable. And the difficulties to be overcome in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today, to me, is a matter of astonishment as well as gratitude. This, for the purpose of this celebration, is the 4th of July. It's the birthday of your national independence and your political freedom. This, to you, is what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance. This celebration also marks the beginning of another year in your national life and reminds you that the Republic of America is now 76 years old. I am glad, fellow citizens, that your nation is so young. You are, even now, only beginning of your national career. career. This lingering in the period of childhood, I repeat, I am glad this is so. There is hope in the thought, and hope is much needed under dark clouds which lower above the horizon. Fellow citizens, 76 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects. The style and title of your sovereign people, in which you now glory, was not then born. <clears throat> you are under the British crown. Your fathers esteemed the English government as the home government, England as the fatherland, although a considerable distance from your home imposed in the exercise of its parental prerogatives upon its colonial children such restraints burdens and limitations as in its mature judgment it deemed wise right and proper but your fathers who had not adopted the idea of the infallibility of government and the absolute character of its acts presumed to differ from the home government in respect to the wisdom and the justice of some of those burdens and restraints they went so far as to pronounce the measures of government unjust, unreasonable, and oppressive, and altogether such as ought not to be quietly submitted to. I scarcely need say, fellow citizens, that my opinion of those measures fully accords with that of your fathers. Feeling them harshly and unjustly treated by the home government, your fathers, like men of honesty, and men of spirit earnestly sought redress. They petitioned and remonstrated. They did so in a decorous, respectful, and loyal manner. This, however, did not answer the purpose. They saw themselves treated with sovereign indifference, coldness, and scorn, yet they persevered. Oppression 
makes a wise man mad. Your fathers became restive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victims of grievous wrongs, wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. With brave men, there is always a remedy for oppression. Just here, the idea of a total separation of the colonies from the crown was born. It was a startling idea, much more so than we at distances of time regard it. The timid and the prudent of that day were, of course, shocked and alarmed by it. Their opposition to the then dangerous thought was earnest and powerful. But amid all their terror and a frightened vociferations against it, the alarming and revolutionary idea moved on and the country with it. On the 2nd of July, 1776, the old Continental Congress, to the dismay of the lovers of ease and the worshippers of property, clothed that dreadful idea with all the authority of national sanction. They did so in the form of a resolution. We seldom hit upon resolutions drawn up in our day whose transparency is at all equal to it. Resolved that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. Citizens, your fathers made good that resolution. They succeeded. Tucks. Uh, citizens, your father made good that resolution. They succeeded, and today you reap the fruits of their success. The freedom gained is yours, and you therefore may properly celebrate this anniversary. The 4th of July is the first great fact in your nation's history the very ring bolt in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Pride and patriotism, not less than gratitude, prompt you to celebrate and to hold it in perpetual remembrance. I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's destiny. So indeed I regard it. The principles contained in that instrument are saving principles. Stand by those principles. Be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes, and at whatever cost. Fellow citizens, I am not wanting in respect for the fathers of this republic. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes. And for the good they did and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. They loved their country better than their own private interests, and all will concede that it is a rare virtue that ought to, be, that ought to command respect. He who will intelligently lay down his life for his country is a man whom it is not in human nature to despise. Your fathers stake their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor, on the cause of this country. In their admiration of liberty, they lost sight of all other interests. They were peacemen, but they preferred revolution to peaceful submission to bondage. They were quiet men, but they did not shrink from agitating against oppression. They showed forbearance, but they knew its limits. They believed in order, but not in the order of tyranny. With them, nothing was settled that was not right. With them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final. <laughs> not slavery and not oppression. You may well cherish the memory of such men. 
They were great in their day and generation. Their solid manhood stands out the more as we contrast it with these degenerate times. How circumspect, exact, and proportionate were all their movements. How unlike the politicians of an hour. Their statesmanship looked beyond the passing moment and stretched away in strength into the distant future. Mark them, fully appreciating the hardship to be encountered, firmly believing in the right of their cause, wisely measuring the terrible odds against them, your fathers, the fathers of this republic, laid the cornerstone of the national superstructure, which has risen and still rises in grandeur around you. That's incredible. Of this fundamental work, this day is the anniversary. Our eyes are met with demonstrations of joyous enthusiasm. The causes which led to the separation of the colonies from the British crown have never lacked for a tongue. They have all been taught in your common schools, narrated at your firesides, unfolded from your pulpits, and thundered from your legislative halls, and are familiar to you as household words. They form the staple of your national poetry and eloquence. I leave, therefore, the great deeds of your fathers to others. My business, if I have any here today, is with the present. The accepted time with God and his cause is the ever-living now. We have to do with the past only as we can make it useful to the present and to the future. Now is the time, the important time. Your fathers have lived, died, and have done their work, and have done much of it well. You live and must die, and you must do your work. You have no right to enjoy a child's share in the labor of your fathers unless your children are to be blessed by your labors. You have no right to wear out and waste the hard-earned fame of your fathers to cover your indolence. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I, or those I represent, to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? Would God, both for your sake and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions? Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful? But such is not the case. I say it with a sad sense of the disparity between us. I am not included <clears throat> within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in feathers, fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems were in human mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, 
I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with the popular theme would be treason most scandalous and shocking and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject, then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day from the slave's point of view, standing here identified with the American bondman making his wrongs mine, I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than this 4th of July. <clears throat> Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce, with all the emphasis I can command, everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate, I will not excuse, I will use the severest language I can command, and yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice or who is not at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right and just. I fancy I hear some one of my audience say, it is just in this circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists fail to make a favorable impression on the public mind. Would you argue more and denounce less? Would you persuade more and rebuke less? Your cause be much more likely to succeed. But, I submit, where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? On what branch of the subject do the people of this country need light? Uh, must I undertake to prove that the slave is a man? The slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of laws for their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience of part of the slave. There are 20, 72 crimes in the state of Virginia which, if committed by a black man, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of the same citizens will subject a white man to the like punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and respectable being. Southern statue books are covered with enactments forbidding, under severe fines and penalties, the teaching of a slave to read or to write. When you can point to any such laws in reference to the beasts of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in your streets, when the fowls of the air, when the cattle on your hills, when the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, then I will argue with you that the slave is a man. It is not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold. That, while we are reading, writing, and ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that, while we are engaged in all manner of enterprises common to other men, 
digging gold in California, capturing the whale in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian's God and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty, that he is the rightful owner of his own body? Would you, you have already declared it? Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation as a matter beset with great difficulty, involving a doubtful application of the principle of justice hard to be understood? How should I look today in the presence of Americans to show that men have a natural right to freedom? To do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters? Must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I have better employments for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. What then remains to be argued? Is it that slavery is not divine? That God did not establish it? That our doctors of divinity are mistaken? There is blasphemy in that thought, that which is inhuman cannot be divine. Who can reason on such a proposition? I cannot. The time for such argument is past. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument, is needed. Oh, had I the ability, and could I reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of bright biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. What, to the American slave, is your 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty, an unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty, inequality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgiving, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. Good. 
there is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of the everyday practices of this nation, and you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. Take the American slave trade, which we are told by the papers is especially prosperous right now, as the price of men was never higher, and which is carried on in all the large towns and cities in one half of this confederacy. This trade is one of the peculiarities of American institutions. In several straight states, this trade is the chief source of wealth. It is called the inter internal slave trade in order to divert it to uh, divert it from the horror with which the foreign slave trade is contemplated. The foreign slave trade has long since been denounced by this government as piracy, as an execrable traffic. To arrest it, this nation keeps a squadron at immense cost on the coast of Africa. Everywhere in this country, it is safe to speak of this foreign slave trade as a most inhuman traffic, opposed alike to the laws of God and of man. It is, however, a notable fact that while so much execration is poured out by Americans upon those engaged in the foreign slave trade, the men engaged in the slave trade between the states pass without condemnation, and their business is deemed honorable. Behold the practical operation of this internal slave trade, the American slave trade, sustained by American politics and American religion. Here you will see men and women reared like swine for the market. You know what is a swine drover, drover? I will show you a man drover. They inhabit all our southern states. They perambulate the country and crowd the highways of the nation with droves of human stock. You will see one of these human flesh jobbers armed with pistol, whip, and bowie knife driving a company of a hundred men, women, and children from the Potomac to the slave market in New Orleans. These wretched people are to be sold singly or in lots to suit purchasers. They are food for the cotton field and the deadly sugar mill. Mark the sad procession as it moves wearily along and the inhuman wretch who drives them. Hear his savage yells and his blood-chilling oaths as he hurries on his affrighted captives. There, see the old man with locks, thin and gray. Pass one square, if you please, on that young mother, be shouldering a bear to his fortune's son, the grinding eye falling on the brow of a babe in her army. <laughs> See, too, that girl being weeping. Yes, weeping as she thinks of the mother from whom she has been torn. The drove moves slowly, heartily. Heat and sorrow have nearly consumed their strengths. Suddenly you hear a quick snap, like the discharge of a rifle. The fetters clank, and the chain rattles simultaneously. Your ears are saluted with a scream that seems to have torn its way to the center of your soul. The crack you heard was the sound of the slave whip. The scream you heard was the woman who you saw with the babe. Her speed had faltered under the weight of her child and her chains. That gash on her shoulder tells her to move on. Follow this drove to New Orleans. Attend the auction. 
See men examined like horses. See the forms of women rudely and brutally exposed to the shocking gaze of American slave buyers. See this drove sold and separated forever and never forget the deep, sad sobs that arose from the scattered multitude. Tell me, citizens, where under the sun can you witness a spectacle more fiendish and shocking? Yet this is but a glimpse of the American slave trade as it exists at this moment in the ruling part of the United States. I was born amid such sights and scenes. To me, the American slave trade is a terrible reality. The fleshmongers gather up their victims by dozens and drive them chained to the General Depot at Baltimore. When a sufficient number has been collected here, a ship is chartered for the purpose of conveying the forlorn crew to Mob Mobile or to New Orleans. From the slave ship, from the slave prison to the ship, they are usually driven in the darkness of night. In the deep, still darkness of midnight, I have been often aroused by the dead, heavy footsteps and the piteous cries of the chain gangs that passed our door. Fellow citizens, this murderous traffic is today in active operation in this boasted republic. In the solitude of my spirit, I see clouds of dust raised on the highways of the South. I see bleeding footsteps. I hear the doleful wail of fettered humanity on the way to the slave markets where the victims are to be sold like horses and sheep and swine, knocked off to the highest bidder. There I see the tenderest of ties ruthlessly broken to gratify the lust, caprice, and rapacity of the buyers and sellers of men. My soul sickens at the sight. But a still more inhuman, disgraceful, and scandalous state of things remains to be presented. By an act of the American Congress, not yet two years old, slavery has been nationalized in its most horrible and revolting form. Mason and Dixon's line has been obliterated. New York has become as Virginia, and the power to hold, hunt, and sell men, women, and children as slaves remains no longer a mere state institution, but is now an institution of the whole United States. The power is coextensive with the Star Spangled Banner and American Christianity. Where these go may also go the merciless slave hunter. Where these are, man is not sacred. He is a bird for the sportsman's gun. By that most, most foul and fiendish of all human decrees, the liberty and a person of every man are put in peril. Your broad Republican domain is hunting gown for men. Your lawmakers have commanded all good citizens to engage in this hellish sport. Your president, your secretary of state, enforce as a duty you owe to your free and glorious country and to your God that you do this accursed thing. Not fewer than 40 Americans have within the past two years been hunted down and without a moment's warning hurried away in chains and consigned to slavery and excruciating torture. Some of these have had wives and children dependent on them for bread, but of this no account was made. The right of the hunter to his prey stands superior to the right of marriage and to all rights in this republic, the rights of God included. For black men, there is ne neither law nor justice, humanity nor religion. The fugitive slave law makes mercy to them a crime and bribes the judge who tries them. An American judge gets $10 for every victim he consigns to slavery and five when he fails to do so. 
The oath of any two villains is sufficient under this hell black enactment to send the most pious and exemplary black man into the remorseless jaws of slavery. His own testimony is nothing. He can bring no witness for himself. The minister of justice of American justice is bound by the law to hear but one side and that side is the side of the oppressor. Let this damning fact be perpetually told. Let it be thundered around the world that in tyrant killing, king hating, people loving, democratic Christian America, the seats of justice are filled with judges who hold their offices under an open and palpable bribe and are bound in deciding in the case of a man's liberty to hear only his accusers. In glaring violation of justice, in shameless disregard of the forms of administering law, in cunning arrangement to entrap the defenseless, and in diabolical intent, this fugitive slave law stands alone in the annals of tyrannical legislation. Americans, your Republican politics, not less than your Republican religion, are flag flagrantly inconsistent. You boast of your love of liberty, your superior civilization, and your pure Christianity, while the whole political power of the nation is solemnly pledged to support and perpetuate the enslavement of three million of your countrymen. You hurl your anathemas at the crowned head tyrants of Russia and Austria and pride yourselves on the democratic institutions while you yourselves consent to be the mere tools and bodyguards of the tyrants of Virginia and Carolina. You invite to your shores fugitives of oppression from abroad, honor them with banquets, greet them with ovations, cheer them, toast them, salute them, protect them, and pour out your money to them like water. But the fugitives from your own land you advertise, hunt, arrest, shoot, and kill. You glory in your refinement and your universal education, yet you maintain the system as barbar barbarous and dreadful as ever, stained the cr as ever stained the character of a nation, a system begun in avarice, uh, supported in pride, and perpetuated in cruelty. You shed tears over fallen hungry and make the sad story of her wrongs the theme of your poets, statesmen, and orators, till your gallant sons are ready to fly to arms to vindicate her cause against the oppressor. But in regard to the ten thousand wrongs of the American slaves, you would enforce the strictest silence and would hail him as an enemy of the nation who dares to make those wrongs the subject of public discourse. You are all on fire at the mention of liberty for France or for Ireland, but are as cold as an iceberg at the thought of liberty for the enslaved of America. You discourse eloquently on the dignity of labor, yet you sustain a system which, in its very essence, cast a stigma upon labor. You can bare your bosom to the storm of British artillery to throw off a three-penny tax on tea, and yet wring the hard, the last hard-earned farthing from the grasp of the black laborers of your country. You profess to believe that of one blood God made all nations of men to dwell on the face of all the earth and hath commanded all men everywhere to love one another, yet you notoriously hate and glory in your hatred all men whose skins are not colored like your own. You declare before the world and are understood by the world to declare that you hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet you hold securely in a bondage which according to your own Thomas Jefferson is worse than ages 
of that which your fathers rose in re rebellion to oppose, a seventh part of the inhabitants of your country. Fellow citizens, I will not enlarge further on your national inconsistencies. The existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism as a sham, your humanity as a base pretense, and your Christianity as a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad. It corrupts your politicians at home. It saps the foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing and a byword to a mocking earth. It is the antic antagonistic force in your government, the only thing that seriously deserves and endangers your union. It fetters your progress. It is the enemy of improvement, the deadly foe of education. It fosters pride. It breeds insolence. It promotes vice. It shelters crime. It is a curse to the earth that supports it. And yet you cling to it as if it were the sheet anchor of all your hopes. Be warned. A horrible reptile is called up in your nation's, is curl, coiled up in your nation's bosom. The venomous creature is nursing at the tender breast of your youthful republic. For the love of God, tear away and fling from you the hideous monster and let the weight of 20 millions crush and destroy it forever. With me. But it, is, but it is answered in reply to all this that precisely what I have now denounced is, in fact, guaranteed and sanctioned by the Constitution of the United States, that the right to hold and to hunt slaves is a part of that Constitution framed by the illustrious fathers of this republic. Then I dare to affirm, notwithstanding all I have said before, your fathers, instead of being the honest men I have before declared them to be, were the various impostors that ever practiced on mankind. This is the inevitable conclusion, and from it there is no escape. But I differ from those who charge this baseness on the framers of the Constitution of the United States. It is a slander upon their memory, at least so I believe, and others have, as I think, fully and clearly vindicated the Constitution from any design to support slavery for an hour. Allow me to say, in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. I therefore leave off where I began, with hope. While drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. Nations do not now stand in the same relation to each other that they did ages ago. No nation can now shut itself up from the surrounding world and trot round in the same old path of its fathers without interference. The time was when such could be done, but a change has now come over the affairs of mankind. Walled cities and empires have become unfashionable the arm of commerce has borne away the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkest corners of the, of the globe. Wind, steam, and lightning are its chartered agents. Oceans no longer divide, but link nations together. From Boston to London is now a holiday excursion. Space is comparatively annihilated. Thoughts expressed on one side of the Atlantic distinctly heard on the other. In the fervent aspirations of William Lloyd Garrison, I say, and let every heart join in saying it, all God speed the day when human blood shall cease to flow, in every clime be understood the claims of human brotherhood, and each return for evil, good, not blow for blow, that day will come all feuds to end, and change into a faithful friend 
each foe. <laughs> well done, everyone. There are few other speeches by anyone of that era that deliver the moral suasion with such rational clarity and attention to so many details. I don't know about you, but as the wind was blowing and the clouds were overhead, I couldn't help but think of how uncomfortable I am temporarily, but how much we have to continue regardless of how heavy the winds, how dark the clouds. <laughs> The speech is powerful in one way when one person recites it, as Douglas must have spoken it to a crowd unsuspecting of what was coming. But it takes on a different power when so many of us read it, as if a long ago prediction has come to pass, given time, reflection, and living in community even if it isn't utopian, we humans will persist. We will struggle for not only our own rights, but those of our fellows. We will take up the responsibility for caring for and about each other. And today in Northampton, Massachusetts, as was no doubt the case when Douglas spoke here 180 years ago, we will share our multiple histories and work together for our common liberation. Thank you for being here today. Thank you.